I want to propose to you a possible future scenario. It's one that's spectacularly positive for the silver price, and I'll cut to the chase and give you the punchline right up front. In this scenario, the silver price drifts higher, then trend-following funds and performance-chasing investors pile into silver futures and exchange-traded funds, which would dwarf the tiny size of the silver market, setting the silver price soaring and sparking concerns about a physical supply shortage. Then, industrial users who consume about two-thirds of all silver mined every year panic because they realize that their source of supply is not secured. So this huge group of silver buyers who have been comfortable buying silver on an as-needed basis scramble to buy silver at any price while also buying for future years to make sure their supply is secured, therefore massively exacerbating the supply shortage. Who are these industrial buyers? Well, silver is used extensively in electronics and Apple or Samsung, for example, are not going to stop selling phones because they can't get the 20 cents worth of silver that's in your phone. They're going to buy silver at any price and keep selling phones. Now for the disclaimers. I've owned gold and silver in varying degrees for almost 20 years. I currently own them for myself and for clients. This is not a prediction. This is a possible scenario. It's not a recommendation and this is not investment advice. I don't know what's right for your personal financial situation. I am an investment advisor. If you're interested in working together, please send an email to ken at investhuckleberry.com. Early in my career, I'd seen the Asian crisis in 1997 and watched the Fed cut rates in response. Shortly thereafter, and the Y2K concern was also met with easy money. So by the time I lived through the tech bust in 2000, it became totally clear that in the Federal Reserve's foolish quest to eradicate the business cycle, it will always go back to easy money, cutting interest rates, and that this would provide massive credit growth over time relative to income, and ultimately they would slowly, or perhaps at some point quickly, erode the value of the dollar. That's the backdrop. Silver is unique because, like gold, there were many periods in history of the world where silver was a monetary metal. But unlike gold, most of the silver produced is consumed and is never to be recycled. Because silver is part monetary metal and part industrial metal, when the economy is weak, the narrative around silver is that if the economy is in recession, then there will be less industrial demand for silver, which is why gold is making new highs and silver is about 60% below its all-time highs, even when considering its recent strength. So let's talk about my scenario. In economic terms, highly inelastic supply meets demand that's currently elastic, but I think demand will come more inelastic as prices go up. And I'll tell you why. If you don't follow the wonky terms, I promise you will understand exactly what I'm saying by the end of this video. I'd like to start with an analysis of a trade that I was involved in back around 2006. It was uranium. Just to whet your appetite, if you weren't around for this or you weren't paying attention, I'm going to talk about what led to this price move in uranium you see on your screen right now. Let's talk in simple supply and demand terms. Let's take the example of your favorite restaurant. If you got the same service for a lower price, then you would probably go more frequently. And if the price went higher, then you would probably go less. The term for this is that your demand is elastic. The low, at lower prices, you would demand more, and at higher prices, less. This is normal. Back to uranium. Who are the buyers of uranium? The buyers are nuclear power plants. And in the US, we have almost 100 nuclear power plants, and we get almost 20% of our electricity from nuclear. So how elastic is the demand for uranium? Well, these plants are an enormous feat of engineering. They take a very long time to get built. They face significant risk they won't get built. And they're enormously capital intensive, costing as much as $10 billion or more in today's dollars. So if a utility company is operating one of these plants, the incremental cost for uranium is so small compared to the cost of the overall plant. 
The utility company is not going to let the nuclear plant sit idle because it thinks the price of uranium is too high. It's going to buy whatever it needs at whatever the price is. Almost any price, really. This is a totally inelastic demand. Unlike you in your favorite restaurant, where you demand more if the price is low and less if it's high, the utility will buy the same quantity no matter what the price is. That's half the equation. That's the demand side. Let's look at the supply side. Let's say you're a property developer and you've built an apartment building and you find that people are lining up competing with each other to buy these apartments and are willing to pay a high price. In that case, you or someone else are going to build more apartment buildings, creating a greater supply of what's being demanded. So back to uranium, uranium is mined. As you might imagine, if you're an aspiring entrepreneur and you want to start up a uranium mine, you might have a difficult time because no one wants to live next to a uranium mine. Since uranium is naturally radioactive, mining is highly regulated. It wouldn't surprise me if it took you 10 years to open a uranium mine. So if the price of uranium went up a lot, it would take a long time to increase mine production. There was another interesting thing happening with the uranium supply at the time. In 1993, the US and Russia agreed to what was called the megatons to megawatts deal. In this deal, Russia downblended its highly enriched uranium from its nuclear arsenal and sold that now low enriched uranium to the US and we used it in our nuclear plants. So the supply of uranium for our reactors was being met partially with mine supply and was partially met with nuclear decommissioning from Russia. The Russian deal was supposed to last for 20 years, starting in 1993. But to make a long story long, it started to run into problems. The financial markets realized that if and when the Russian uranium didn't reach the market, perhaps because it was significantly used up, which it would certainly be at some point in time, then there would not be enough supply of uranium for the nuclear reactors. And since it takes so long to start up a mine, it was reasoned that the price of uranium would go ballistic in the short term because the utilities would buy at any price and perhaps there would be no price where enough near-term supply could satisfy the demand. The supply was almost totally inelastic. No matter what the price was, the supply didn't change much. Which brings me to silver. Once upon a time, silver trading was denominated by futures trading and this was done predominantly in the US or Western Europe. And when you transact in the futures market, you're buying or selling a standardized contract. And underlying this trading of contracts was physical silver sitting in a vault. And typically, the silver stayed in the vault and it was just the ownership that changed. It's important to note that the amount of silver sitting in the vault represented only a fraction of the outstanding silver contracts. But two important changes have happened in the last couple decades. One is that China, where it was not legal to own gold starting in 1949, started in the early 2000s encouraging its citizens to buy gold and silver. And China started facilitating ways for its citizens to do so. This means that a lot of the physical silver that would have otherwise been sitting in the West has moved to the East where it's been consumed or is sitting in the Shanghai Gold Exchange Vault. This is one way that physical silver has been leaving the old system in the West. The other important change is the proliferation of exchange-traded funds, the largest of which is SLV, which trades on the stock exchange just like Apple or IBM. But SLV is a trust and holds physical silver. It's hotly debated whether SLV owns 100% of the silver it's supposed to own in physical form or instead owns a portion through futures contracts or some other form of so-called paper silver in its place. I'm not going to wade into that discussion, but I'll only say that I've no doubt that the growth of silver ETFs has taken an enormous amount of physical silver off the market that, again, might otherwise be sitting at a futures exchange. Let's look at the supply-demand picture for silver. 
These are supply demand numbers from the Silver Institute. I stress that the global market is opaque, so we don't know all these numbers with certainty. We don't know if these numbers are correct. But over the years, I think these numbers are the best representation out there. Let's start with the supply side. The majority of silver that's mined is produced as a byproduct of mining for lead, zinc, gold, or, and copper. Less than one-third of the silver produced is done so by primary silver miners. So if the price of base metals goes down, then those producers of lead, zinc, and copper are likely to cut production, which will also reduce the production of silver even if the silver price is much higher. The fact that most of the silver mined is not produced by primary silver miners could serve to dramatically reduce the supply response we would otherwise expect to get if the price of silver skyrockets. Said differently, if 100% of the silver was produced by silver miners and the price went up, the silver miners would be scrambling to mine more silver. That's what they do. But if I'm a copper miner and I produce some silver byproduct along the way and the silver price has exploded higher, but the price of copper is stable, then that incremental revenue from the silver byproduct I'm producing might not be enough for me to expand my production of copper much, if at all. So what I'm pointing out is that the supply of silver is not that elastic. If the price of silver goes up a lot, there will be more silver produced but maybe not a lot more. Okay, so that deals with production. But how much gold and silver is there in the world? Let's start with gold. Here's an estimate of all the above ground gold. 197,000 tons is 6.3 billion ounces, and at a price of $1,800 an ounce, that's worth over $11 trillion. And that's gold. No one really cares about gold in the institutional investment world. It's not that highly owned. The value of the global stock and bond markets are so large that if I told you the number, it's almost meaningless to you. It's well over $200 trillion each. I think the amount of above ground silver that exists in the world is anywhere from 3 to 6 billion ounces. And I know that's a big range, but even at the high end, at $20 an ounce, that's only worth $120 billion. Now that sounds like a lot of money. But the U.S. stock market is worth $35 trillion. That's just the U.S. So do I really need to show you a bar chart where one bar is $35 trillion and then a little sliver of a bar down here that's one quarter of 1% of the size of the U.S. stock market at $120 billion? So the $120 billion estimate of silver is tiny, tiny. Most people think there's a lot more silver in the world than gold because the price is so much lower. But that's not true because almost all the gold that's ever been mined still exists above ground, whereas the vast majority of silver that's been mined has been consumed. I'm suggesting that the above ground silver supply is 3 to 6 billion ounces. As I just showed you, gold.com thinks there's 6.3 billion ounces of gold. That means there is less silver than gold, and maybe a lot less if these numbers are correct. Here's a Silver Institute graph of identifiable silver inventories. This doesn't include silver bars and coins and exchange-traded products, for example, but we can get some perspective on the numbers. So, the supply of silver is small, and the mining supply response to a sharp rise in price will be delayed because it takes time to open new mines, and also muted because most of the silver is produced by companies that are not primarily in the business of producing silver. Let's go to the demand side. We can see that roughly 500 million ounces is consumed by the industrial category every year. This number is pretty stable over time. Silver is the best electrical and thermal conductor of all the metals, and so it's used in many electrical applications. Next on the list, they break out the photovoltaic category. Many people don't know that silver is used in solar panels. In the last five or six years, demand has gone up by about 50 million ounces a year in this category, which is good because we see in the next line, photography 
It's been falling for a long time as we've shifted to digital. This chart only goes back to 2011, but from some time before that until now, we've lost about 50 million ounces a year in demand in the photography category. And then the massive swing category is physical investment in bars and coins and investment in exchange traded products. Exchange traded products own over 700 million ounces at the end of 2019. So you can see how big of an impact these exchange traded products have in the market. Let's consider the demand from investors, which is a huge swing, swing factor that I think could one day overwhelm supply. Investors have a tendency to chase performance. This is well documented, and my favorite example is an analysis that showed how poorly the investors did while investing in one of the best performing mutual funds in the 1990s. The fund, run by Ken Hebner, did incredibly well over 10 years with an 18% annualized return. But the typical shareholder in the fund lost 11%. How did this happen? It happened because the results were volatile, and when Hebner had a great year or two, investors bought the fund and money flooded in. And then he had a bad period, and investors sold. Investors bought high and sold low. This is a natural and frequently harmful human tendency. In addition to that, there's a group of commodity trading advisors who manage commodity investing funds that frequently utilize a trend-following strategy. They'll wait for the trend to turn up, and then they'll buy. So unlike my previous example of your favorite restaurant, where you're less likely to go if the prices go up, here we have investors who are more likely to buy when the price goes up. And when they buy, they increase the claims on the existing supply of silver. As I pointed out, the silver supply is being depleted more and more every year because it's being sent to the east or it's sitting in vaults of one of the various exchange traded products. As these forces continue to collide over time, the price could continue to rise and at some point there would be a genuine concern of a shortage. And industrial users will not only purchase what they need today, but I suspect they'll move to buy multiple years worth of, worth of supply in the future. So, we could see demand flooding in while prices are at their highest. Silver represents a very small cost to an enormous assortment of industrial applications. These industrial users are not going to stop their business because the silver price has gone up. And they'll want to be sure that they're not forced to stop their business in the future, regardless of how high the silver price is. Given the importance of silver in manufacturing, antimicrobial uses for medicine and solar power, it also wouldn't surprise me to see governments start stockpiling also at some point, setting up a strategic supply, which would also, of course, add to demand. So that's the explosive scenario. I don't think the investment thesis for silver rests on this scenario. I think it'll do fine over time based on the more mainstream monetary metal analysis that's very similar to gold. But it's this very large existing industrial demand combined with potentially high investment demand for a commodity with a pretty limited and inelastic supply that could make for some real fireworks. A word of warning here. Given the small size of this market, it's prone to manipulation by a small number of big players, either on the upside or the downside. I think a small number of big players operating outside the boundaries of the U.S. law could orchestrate a global supply shortage on their own. And for that matter, a large number of small investors could probably do the same, maybe through some online coordination. Again, this is not investment advice. I don't know if or when this scenario will happen, but the, boss the possibility has always intrigued me. Silver may not be suitable for you. Silver is very volatile. Speaking for myself, I have a long-term outlook, and my position size is such that I won't be forced to sell if there's downside volatility. That's it. Please subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Thanks for listening.